Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Welcome to worship this Sunday. Uh, next week is Palm Sunday. We are approaching Easter, and it is so good to have journeyed and to keep journeying through Lent with all of you. For Good Friday and Easter, we are going to have worship in this room. Good Friday at 6.30 p.m. and Easter morning at 11 a.m., we will be in the sanctuary. Our COVID restrictions, masking and distancing will apply. We'll have some of these pews uh, roped off to allow for some distancing. Um, but it will be a joyous time to return. So if you've been vaccinated and you've been thinking about it, it would be a great day to um, come worship God. If you want to wait for another day, that would be fine as well. I'm going to have some overflow in the fellowship hall as well. We are going to try to make this as safe as our great worship in the fellowship hall has been. So I, I hope you will consider joining us, but you should not feel pressured to join us. We'll still have Easter here, and, and Jesus, God willing, will still rise from the dead. Other than that, I want to uh, mention also that uh, Swepsonville Day is happening that Saturday before Easter. We're going to have a little uh, tent set up down at the farmer's market if you want to stop by um, and just see what's going on there. It'd be a great chance to see people in the community and meet some of our neighbors. Other than that, let's worship God in spirit and in truth. As I light this candle, as I struggle to light it, I'm sure, I want you to try to let God center your heart, to calm some of that noise, and, and let the Spirit of God speak through this time of devotion, perhaps through my words, but perhaps just in this time of contemplation. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, to you all hearts are open and all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may truly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture lesson will come from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. When we read the Ten Commandments a few weeks ago, we responded with the response, Almighty God, write your law upon our hearts. Well, here in Jeremiah, uh, after the people have gone into exile, is God's promise to write the law on their hearts, and we pray upon ours. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you think for a moment about something you know by heart. What is something that you know by heart? A poem, a scripture, a song, or perhaps a place that you know like the back of your hand, that you know as well as anyone. 
Doesn't it feel different to know something by heart? To really know it? I was thinking about this. Uh, a couple times a week, I'll drive Aaron to work, and, and we go just, it's 54 all the way, basically. And by now, as with many of you out there, I know every twist and turn on that highway. It's a, it's a windy highway, and I know every one. And so when we've had some rough weather or some rain, it is frustrating for me because I still want to go 60 or whatever I would drive on the highway. A little more than that. And people, if you end up behind someone, it's a two-lane highway, who doesn't know the highway, they don't know the turns, and so they'll slow down. It was foggy the other day. Probably a safe idea. But it's frustrating because I know the curves. I know where the road's headed, and so I want to go fast. And if you know a town or a city very well, it affects how you drive around in it. When I was a, a caterer, uh, I would drive all around Duke and around Durham. And by the, by the end of my time there, I took the golf cart almost everywhere because Duke is a lot easier to get around when you don't have to take the roads for cars, when you can use the walkways and the paths. And I knew that traffic would be bad in certain spots, or I knew a better access point that wasn't readily accessible from the street, especially because Duke has such a big quad area that cars can't really get to. And when I would drive around Durham, if there was traffic or if it was a certain time of day, I would always take the back roads or take a side road because I knew that area by heart. If I had to go out to the airport, which I did a few times, I would know that I did not want to sit on 147 at 8 in the morning, and so I would go around some back ways. When you know something by heart, you experience it differently. I think about playing music. You all have seen me play some songs on here, and I am sure that it is very clear when I know a song and I don't have to look at the chords or look at the words, when I just know it and can play it, versus when I have to read the music off a sheet. We would have this experience in choir sometimes where if we're learning a song <clears throat> or if a song is new to us, our heads are right in the music. You know, you, you have to read it and have to see the notes to really follow along. And then sometimes Eileen would pull out a song that, not me because I'm new, but the rest of them had sung a dozen times. And they would just go to town. It was so much more fun when you know a song by heart, when you can really belt it out. You can play with the tempo or play with your inflection. When you really know a song, it just comes out differently. And that's why it's so amazing to see music artists perform because they perform night after night after night and so the songs are second nature and they play around with it and they do fun things because they know the song by heart. I was watching the, the Oscar-winning documentary Free Solo which is great, although nerve-wracking if you have not seen it. It's about this man, I should have looked up his name, it's Sam something. He free solos mountains, uh, uh, like rock climbing faces, which means he climbs them without a rope or a harness, which is something, no, just no. But what's, what's amazing about watching him climb is he climbs, in the movie, spoilers, uh, he summits Katahdin, uh, the, the peak in Yosemite. This is a climb that someone who does not know the mountain, it will take them days to do. People camp on the side of the cliff in, you know, suspended sleeping bags. It takes people days w without a harness, without a rope, he climbs it in four hours because he's done it so many times with the rope, with the harness. He knows the mountain. 
And there's this incredible sequence where he's working out a difficult uh, section of the mountain. And you see him figuring out every single move his hands and feet will make. Exactly where he will place his hand and where his other hand will have to go. Until it is second nature to him. Until he knows it by heart. And so when he goes out on the day to do this dangerous, ridiculous thing, he doesn't have to think about it. He knows it by heart. He'd been up that mountain dozens and dozens of times. It's an incredible thing to know something by heart. And what all these things tell us is that knowing something by heart is not the same as having it memorized. I could memorize the words to a piece of music, but unless I have performed it, unless I have sung it and done it in front of people, it's just up here. I haven't practiced it. Something that I always try to remember is that Jeremiah and Jesus, who in many ways is drawing on the tradition Jeremiah established, these prophets, they don't attack atheists. They're not out here fighting with secular people, with people who don't believe the people that Jeremiah comes after, and if you read Jeremiah, he comes after some people, and Jesus is the same. The people they come after are the religious people. The people who should know better. The false prophets. They come after the religious leaders who know the scripture as well as anyone. The Pharisees that Jesus fights with and the prophets that Jeremiah argues with they probably had the Torah memorized. The whole Torah, they knew it in their head, every word. But it wasn't written on their heart. Jeremiah calls out the false prophets who call for peace, for call who, for Jeremiah to be quiet, who call for the people to be peaceful when they have allowed oppression to happen, when they have forgotten orphans, widows, immigrants. These are the, these are the things that Jeremiah attacks this, this nation for. You think you know it, and yet you let these things happen. You focus so much on being right that the law is not written on your heart. They know that the law is not written on the hearts even of these educated religious leaders because they don't live it. Because of their fruit, Paul says, uh, uh, maybe Jesus says, everyone says, you know people by their fruit, by what they, they do. Not because works will save us, because, but because they reveal what we know in our heart. And so, if you can walk into the temple and praise God, but not question why people are going hungry, then the law isn't quite on your heart. It was a, a stunning but unsurprising thing this week to hear that this, this shooter who committed these horrific and seemingly racially motivated attacks. This shooter in Atlanta was a Christian, as have been uh, many such domestic terrorists or, or mass killers in, in recent history. He was a Christian, the son of a minister, as if I remember right, and someone who attended church. Now our temptation is to say, well, he can't really have been a Christian.
But that's not really for us to say. He was a church-going person. He probably knew the scripture as well as you or I. And yet we have to ask what our Christianity has done if it never came in conflict with these acts he decided to perform. And even if we want to dig into that particular case and consider the, the mental state or whatever that was going on that would lead someone to, to murder people, Christianity has consistently been found to be consistent with racism. Hopefully not now, and hopefully we resist that. But the reason there is an AME church, the, that's the African Methodist Episcopal Church, um, the, the Black Methodist Church, there are several of them, they are not one body, is because the reason um, that there are, there are also historically black churches in our conference and in our denomination, but the reason many uh, Methodists are segregated in some ways is because in the 1800s, many of our churches, uh, if they had allowed uh, African-American people, they made them sit in the balcony. And when uh, they said, we want to be able to sit wherever we want, they kicked them out. They forcibly removed them from worship. Now, hopefully, we have gotten beyond that. But there were people sitting in the pews that day who let that happen. And unfortunately, for years and decades, we, I shouldn't say we, some people have professed Christian faith and stood by while atrocities were committed before them. Lord, we still need the law written on our hearts. And, and I hope, and I pray, and I, I pray to God, and my, my experience is that hopefully we have moved past and are moving past and are, and are deeply trying to make steps towards a more just, uh, a more equitable society for everyone. And a more equitable church, by the way. Hopefully we are moving past those things, and yet... My experience is that sometimes we are still subject to purity culture, to a sort of rigid inflexibility of who we accept and who we don't. And many of the things uh, all denominations fight over is who do we ordain? Who do we marry? Who do we let be members and who do we let be leaders and who do we let teach and who do we let preach? Who is in and who's out? We want our churches to preach the good news and to proclaim truth. But what Jesus says is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Quoting the Torah, all of the law hangs on this. God says to Jeremiah, I will write my law on their hearts. If we know it by heart, it comes out differently. We might still have discussions about who to include or where to include them. But the overwhelming activity is of love. And not just saying, hate the sin, love the sinner. But loving them. And questioning whether our idea of sin might be messed up. To have the law written on our hearts means we can take the side road sometimes. There is more flexibility when the law is written on your heart. Not because the law is malleable or breakable or subject to the whims of society, but because the law is love. In Leviticus, which, which I always thought of as these rigid sacrificial codes, if you cannot afford uh, livestock to sacrifice, 
you can make a grain offering. Or you can sacrifice a dove if you can't afford a bull. The law allows for different dynamics in our society, all in the pursuit of love of God and love of neighbor. To have the law written on your heart is like climbing the mountain. You gotta know it in your body. You have to have lived it. When we just try to know things up here, we're too simple to figure it out. It's gotta be all the way through here. And so, Christians sometimes do things that seem to conflict with one another because our rule is love. We should condemn violence, like that, viol that uh, racially motivated violence against Asian Americans in Atlanta. And we should ensure that people who commit crimes get fair treatment when, they, when or if they are imprisoned. We should do both because the rule is love. We can pray and pray and work for international peace, and yet we must continue to support people who have served our country in the armed forces. If we were just thinking up here, you might draw a line and say, well, if I, can't, if I don't like that, then I can't do this. But the rule is love. Jesus, fights with the Pharisees, and then he eats dinner with them. Because the rule is love, and the law is in our hearts. If we're going to climb up this mountain with God's help, the thing to do is to be like Jesus, to live like Jesus. The only way to get your law, the law in your heart, is through Jesus Christ, through faith in him, faith with the, which is not just up here, but faith which we know by heart and live in our bodies. And so I picked a song. I know I'm running long. I picked a song by Charles Wesley, Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a, a, a prayer in a hymn for a heart that truly loves God, a heart that is truly seeking to be obedient, not just here, but here. And I picked a tune for it that I know pretty well, so hopefully I can have some fun with it. Uh, but we'll see how that goes. You all know that I'm not always the most precise musician. This song is called, Oh for a Heart to Praise My God, and I'm gonna play it to the tune of Amazing Grace. Oh for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free. Thy nature, gracious. 
us, Lord, impart. Come quickly from above. Write thy new name upon my heart. Thy new best name of love. Would you pray with me? Thy nature, gracious Lord, impart. Come quickly from above. Write thy new name upon my heart, thy new best name of love. Go forth with, with God's name and the name of Jesus Christ on your heart. In the name of Jesus Christ, with the Father, in the Holy Spirit. Amen.